KSMO Studios. It's seven minutes after the nine o'clock hour begins, and Deb Hobson's made her way in. It's good to see you. Happy Independence Day, a day late. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you did have a little time off, right? I a little bit of time. Ooh, yeah, so we uh, all get off. Most of us get off the July Fourth or any holiday, basically. But uh, sometimes we have to take call, which I did. But it was an uneventful day as far as the hospital goes, so that was good. <laughs> Kept you at home and grilling yes. and then and just, just nice hanging and out. Cool. There you go. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice and, cool. and cool. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, this is uh, obviously been a fairly warm summer, too. So we have had some heat issues with yes, some we people, have. too. And people do need to watch out. There are some symptoms of the heat, aren't there? There is. I mean, um, excessive sweating, increased thirst. Um, sometimes we don't hydrate enough, you know, and look at those all these activities going on and runners and things like that it's really important that we stay hydrated um, you could get become heat exhausted really easily and then if we're not paying attention it leads into heat stroke and we don't want that to happen so lots of things we should be doing hydration is the big thing um, watch for those high temps things like that when you're out doing things get into cooling stations make sure you uh, you bring things to stay cool and everybody is different some people can handle the heat better than others True. but just at the parade yesterday deb i saw some people with just brilliant red faces and i know that they got to be hot that you know it, it makes me look, makes me feel hot looking at their face that can be a sign too that you're actually overheating or getting dehydrated isn't it that is true it is true and you have to be careful because some of those people whether they're the really young or the elderly folks um on all those blood pressure medicines things like that those play a role and in, in getting heat exhaustion a little quicker than you know anything could could trigger that a little quicker than it would some people that could tolerate it much better that are not on all those things or have those medical issues but um, absolutely the flushed face the um, maybe feeling really really dry um, sweating Get a little lightheaded, lightheaded sometimes. Lightheaded, yes, true. You know, and and the, and the sad part about it is, is that people think that they can bull their way through it, yeah. and you really can't. When it comes to heat exhaustion or heat stroke, that's not something you want to play with because obviously it can shut, start shutting down it bodily functions, functions you have to have true. to to make it through the day and and that's just not something you want to go to the hospital with and they're going to have to try and get these things reactivated get a whole bunch of fluids in you to try and mm -hmm. get kidneys and liver going and things of that nature and that, that can be a very scary situation it, it can be very scary and you know we're so used to being in the cool air the the air conditioning and stuff like that when i don't know you remember when you were younger we didn't have air conditioning in oh, our I home know. so we may have probably tolerated the heat a little bit better than what we do today because we're in that air conditioning and then going out and thinking that we can but unless you're in it out often like the, the farmers are out in it often mm -hmm. they probably know enough to be packing those cool drinks and things like that to prepare for that day out in the field or whatever but um, if you're not used to it then you're gonna you're gonna become a little exhausted much quicker all right and that's why we we try and explain to people uh, on the air when we know we're gonna have a hot day get out there and get it done this yeah. morning you know right. as, as the temperature rises a little you're okay but it, you know just like you're saying we're so att attuned to the air conditioning of our bodily systems we are so in tune to 75 78 maybe 80 yeah and you walk out in 103 and high humidity and it's like somebody hits you in the face with a baseball bat and you can feel it and immediately you start to perspire immediately you start to feel wore out you do you get tired really quickly um <clears throat> You just if there's no air moving you know you get that kind of tightness in your chest and think man it's just so hot i can't breathe out here because because we don't have any air moving st and stuff like that so and we have had some issues with bad air we have yeah. had the fires coming out of canada that have gotten True. in our area has there have there been some people coming to the hospital that have had some issues breathing because of that well this time of the year you we always kind of see respiratory stuff when the weather's hot like this whether mm -hmm. it's too hot or whether it's in the extreme colds your copd patients your asthma patients and and the pollen and stuff that's been out there early this year i mean it's been crazy mm -hmm. i mean that stuff if and it's still blowing yeah, i mean you're I still seeing stuff out there and that does affect those respiratory patients probably a little quicker than maybe maybe someone who doesn't have those kind of underlying problems but um <clears throat> yeah 
it's just it's uh it's kind of hard it just hits you like a wall and you just think man i don't know if i can be out here yeah i i know st louis has had the uh, air quality in orange quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, i was just up in michigan where they had it at red at many times which means they don't want you outside at all but unfortunately you still got to go outside do things go to work right. whatever you have to do right uh, so you, you just really want to make sure that if you have issues breathing issues and you hear about these fires it doesn't necessarily mean a fire in Canada is going to be bringing most of its smoke down here. Right. It just so happens that we were getting it. So adding that with the the pollen, adding that with the heat and putting it all together, it just it's just another layer that you may be going right. through and trying to breathe free and easy. True, true. So, very good. Well, we've got some other stuff to talk about today besides heat. We've true. We've seen the heat. <laughs> True. Right, let's, let's talk. What, what would you like to talk about, Deb? I'm going to leave it up to you. All right, perfect. So, so I just wanted to kind of go over some things, the things that I'm kind of monitoring every day. We think the end of COVID has finally gotten here, but not really. No. I mean, it's never really going to go away. Uh, we have relaxed our masking policy. We don't require anyone to be masked when they come in. We do ask if you have a cough, though, or a fever or something's going on and you're, you're coming in and not feeling well, we ask that you... You mask if you're visiting a patient uh, because that means you're bringing something to the hospital. Right. Um, the other thing that I have going on that uh, I've been reaching out to the community to start doing those CPR classes. When COVID hit, we kind of stopped a lot of those things. That's true. So the volume on those community classes is, have increased for me, which is great. I like doing them. And um, in the month of May, I think I've done about six or seven of them. And that Good. doesn't include the employee education that I'm doing every month as well. So, and then I just wanted to bring back up the community blood drive is coming July 14th from nine to two. It'll be in our, the doctor's library, the meeting room that we use and do, you can schedule an appointment actually for that. And you don't have to sit and wait in line and you can go to www.cbco.org forward slash donate and schedule an appointment and then and then you just come in that appointment time so there's mm -hmm. uh incentives that they're doing they're calling a pint for a pint uh so from some participating breweries <laughs> i probably didn't say that quite right uh it could be a drink of your choice <laughs> free t-shirts and free ice cream vouchers for as long as those last uh, we're doing a little incentive for inside the hospital to uh, get employees, more employees to donate. We Our numbers are a little bit low. We used to have uh, numbers up in the 20 to 25 range, and we've been really low in comparison to that. So we're, I'm trying to do a little incentive to get more employees' participation. Well, and a little bit of that CBCO, they're not promoting it as far out as ahead of time as they used to. Right. And that's another mm -hmm. problem because here again in the summertime, people make plans and mm -hmm. – Oh, wait a minute. Well, there's a blood drive now? I mean, I got the release actually Friday. Correct. Friday is basically the first, you know, it's June 30th. Right. Well, okay, if it's going to be, I think the first one is First Baptist Church. Right. It's the 11th and then July the 11th. on the 14th. Right. Well, that's only two weeks, and you got a holiday in there. So that's not giving you a lot of time to really get the information out to, so people can sign up. True. It's, uh, so we did get it, like you said, that last that last week or... Uh, I know I've week, I've yeah. passed out flyers uptown already, you know, and I make sure I go around the hospital and all the departments have the flyers and notifications and stuff like that. But you're right. Uh, with the uh, First Baptist having their blood drive on July 11th, mm -hmm. uh, those people usually that go to that blood drive, so say you have somebody who can't make it that day, they can come to the July 14th mm -hmm. one at the hospital. So when they have them at certain areas the public is definitely welcome and we encourage them to come if sure. they can so if they do one blood drive they might not be eligible for the other one because of the time in between one right yeah. but however if you do the hospital one then of course you're coming back to the that that time frame so uh, we kind of looked at that we uh, are trying to do what we can do to bring people in and, and encourage staff to donate as well and just seemed before COVID, there used to be a bigger separation in there. It yes. used to be near the end of the mm -hmm. month, I think, the hospital was getting their blood drives. And then True. First Baptist was usually the second Tuesday of the month all the time. Yeah. 
you know. So I don't I don't know if that has something to do with it. I don't know what the change is. It's not the yeah. change on our part, probably. Maybe availability of the room. I don't know if the community blood drive folks have something going on. <laughs> I don't I don't know. <laughs> well, they had a big change. Obviously, with COVID, everything changed. It had a big yeah. change over in personnel, and so maybe some of those standing dates that used to be there. Or just they, not there. They're, they're not they're there. Not there. Yeah. So yeah. we're thinking about at the hospital maybe just doing it a couple times a year so that uh, maybe it'll give it some time in between the First Baptist one. Uh, this one I didn't even realize that First Baptist was having one July 11th when they gave me the date for July 14th. I just, okay, but so they get their congregation. So that's what they're getting mostly at, at First Baptist. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't affect employees at the hospital or others that maybe don't go there so yeah. that's what they're thinking well let, let's talk a little bit about, about the blood drive how important is it in the summertime to get people to donate because just we're talking about vacations you usually have well some a lot of people that make their donations usually do it eight or nine times a mm-hmm. year and they're pretty consistent about it True. you can count on them yeah well but in the summertime when everybody's traveling those numbers tend drop. to be a little bit smaller they do they drop um so Maybe it's good to have one um, a month apart or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. No. But um, but if you it's like important. to give, if you like to give, it's really important, and we appreciate everyone that does donate and give. Um, and of course, with summertime comes trauma and that kind of stuff, and uh, we need blood just as much or often in the summertime as we do in the wintertime as well. You know, so it's it's very important. Blood saves a life. We all know that. And, it, it really does, and and, and it just it doesn't take that much time. But if you're feeling ill, please don't go. True. You know, you know, they won't they won't accept your blood if if you're. And if you've been on antibiotics, I think like a week before, mm-hmm. two weeks before, you can't give blood. Also, so yeah, if you you know if you know that ahead of time, you don't want to come and give blood then. Right. But so when you do make your appointment, by the way, you can call and make that appointment, or you can yes, go online. They do true. ask those questions. By the way, are you on medication, mm-hmm. and what type of medication is it, so that. They can either say yes, you're you're able to donate, or no, you're going to have to wait until you, the next cycle to go and donate. But very important to please, if you can, please donate blood because that's what we're talking about. Maybe some of the normal, regular people that don't normally would give, they're not able to now because they're on vacation, and we need as much blood donated as we possibly can get. You Absolutely. Know, you know, you know as well as I do. Somebody that has an accident and they're losing blood, and and you put a pint or two or three. Uh, next thing you know, you might be using seven or eight units That's for true. one person. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's uh, true. And then that can suddenly, you watch your supply suddenly drop. It's just Absolutely. Not a good thing. So good. If you have any questions about that, can they call you at the hospital? Absolutely. 573-729-6626. My new extension is 3500. 3500. We all getting new extensions Yes, now? we have new phones, so everyone's <laughs> got a new extension. <laughs> I didn't know they had them all working yet or not. Oh, they yeah. Had some of them working. Okay, very yeah. good. Very good. I know mine. I may not know someone else's. But I know mine. <laughs> 3,500. That's dead. All right. Very good. What else would you like to so do? So the other thing, go, I, do, I do this every day. It's called infection surveillance. And so mm-hmm. I'm always looking for infections that we may have at the hospital. And, you know, when they're on those great big antibiotics, we're looking to get them off as soon as we can. So I'm always looking into that and seeing who's got what and what's going on and that kind of thing. The other thing that I things that i report dog bites cat bites we've had several this year already and july 4th holiday there's two <laughs> you know so that's all that's always ongoing that's just that's not stuff. unusual because no. dogs are very sensitive and so are cats to that bang yeah and a lot of people you know kids don't think about it and they go to reach down for that animal and a firecracker or something go off that dog's going to react yeah exactly exactly and then um for me, basically, that's it. That's just stuff that I do every day. And so I just thought I'd give boring a little. Boring everyday stuff. Boring everyday stuff. But it's vital <laughs> for those people. I mean, you're taking a lot of information there. It's a lot of yeah, data. A lot of data. That you have. True. And then you compile that data, and then you, you, you put your report together at the end of the day and see where we stand today. And basically, that's what you do. That's what I do, yeah. I, re- I report all these things to the hospital quarterly. So there's a meeting that I hold, and... Yeah, uh, several of us go to that meeting, and so we report that. But these things are reported daily as I get them to the local health department. And then, of course, there's data that I report to the state. So I'm always reporting to somebody, whether it's quarterly, every day, or monthly. 
uh, it's just ongoing every day. <laughs> and and Deb, that is a misconception I think a lot of people have with the Den County Health Department and the hospital. They work in tandem all the time. True. You know, and if somebody said, well, they don't get along, I said, I, I never heard that. <laughs> you know, but, you know, yeah. I, I know they have to work together for a lot of different things. And there's different things that health department uh, health department does versus the hospital obviously but there's still some data that has to be moved between the two exactly and they are a great resource uh for me and i for them you know if they're missing some documentation or something they need from the hospital um on their go-to person usually uh so we we have a good relationship i you know, I'd like to think that we do anyway. So I'm so. every other day I'm calling Trish probably about something because she knows <laughs> something that I don't know or, you know, or vice versa. So um, <clears throat> we work with them on different levels. Um, I don't know if you're aware, uh, you're aware of the health care coalitions that are out there. Mm -hmm. So we are still a part of the Southwest Health Care Coalition, and we re I represent the East Division of that Southwest. Wow. So and um, just something else. Just something else. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, health department's involved in that as well right. you know so that's just another another resource for us and uh another networking working relationship that we have just trying to keep people healthy and the best way to do that is communication and sure. that that kind of communication vital to keeping people going especially when they don't know what they have true you know if you got a cut you know what it's a cut you know if you get an infection that cut okay you can pretty well know that mm -hmm. but it's these other things that you don't know that you don't know that become and i hate to do like surprise you know <laughs> but here it is <clears throat> and there are a lot of those things out there in our everyday life we just don't know what's going to happen we next. just don't know and one of the things I wanted to talk about, I mean, we've talked a lot about different types of infections mm -hmm. and, and what we should do to take care of our skin when someone when we get hurt or we have that laceration. But I'd like to put a name to it today. So it, it doesn't matter if it's a, a laceration or you get an abscess underneath the skin from an injury or you have a major surgery. Um, sepsis is something that um, is very serious. That's a medical emergency. And um, oh, I'm just going to read a little bit. It's the body's extreme response to an infection causing your organs to shut down one by one and can cause death if we're not paying attention or know the signs. And I've seen this so, so many times. You'll have a young adult person have maybe a major surgery when they were healthy before, but, you know, something wasn't right. Obviously, they had to have the surgery. So when they, they do well in the hospital, they go home. <clears throat> And say they go home and <clears throat> they have a little kiddo at home that had a cold, maybe had a little bit of a temp. They don't now, but uh, and a few days after they're home, they start not feeling well. They they sometimes have a tendency to put that off because the kiddo was sick, and they think it's no big deal. Not a you know, I, I'm going to be able to I'm going to be able to get over this. I'm just going to kind of wait. And you should never just wait. If you develop a temperature, if you start having extreme pain. Uh, if your skin becomes pale, you're, you'll have a loss of appetite. Don't ignore those things because this is a, this is a big deal. Sepsis is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. And all because we think we're going to get over it. We think we can fight this off. It's not because of the surgery they just had. It's, it's because we, the, the whole family maybe had a little bit of cold or something. Right. You know, and maybe that's the case. Maybe, maybe you did develop a little bit of of a temperature because whatever one had the other one's getting but don't wait five days down the road to figure that out you need to be calling your doctor and seeing them soon if you can't get into that appointment soon I always I always say go to the ER uh, because sepsis is something that we need to treat quickly we need to identify it quickly right. uh, because your organs do shut down you get really sick you go to an ICU and you can have those feelings if you feel like man i just i feel like i'm gonna die you know because you're that sick that sepsis and and we need to do something about it you need those big antibiotics and the problem with that is when we wait so long to get to the hospital or or to see our doctor because we're having some symptoms we think are just going to go away um we get readmitted to the hospital and you're more likely if you have sepsis to have that readmission 30 days after a discharge from a hospital another readmission and you're looking at maybe being there 30 days and then of course being in that hospital i mean 
if you thought being in the hospital for surgery was long because you had to be there for seven or ten days, you know, because it was a major surgery sure. or whatever, you know what it feels like to be in the hospital, not be at home, and not have that all that family contact. You know, you, you get you get a little depressed sometimes, uh, but if you have that readmission, you're going to be there longer because because sepsis is a big deal. You may end up in an ICU that just extended your hospital stay. You know, and it's frustrating. It's frustrating to the person who, who was maybe a healthy, healthy individual, um, and they thought they could just kick this, I guess. Uh, well, so, we're all super persons, don't yeah, you know we that? Are. We, we are. No, we, we can all get, and, and you know, I think that's, that starts when we're younger. Oh, it's just a cut, or it's just mm -hmm. this, you know. Don't worry about it. It'll go away. Well, if it doesn't go away in a short period of time, you've got an issue. And you know, we were talking before we came on the air. My brother ended up with sepsis in an infected knee. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any surgery. He didn't do anything. How it got infected that badly, doctors didn't know, but they do know one thing. When After he passed out and they brought him to the hospital, they only gave him a 20% chance of making it because it already had gotten into his right. system. It was already starting to affect his organs. You have to get, I mean, they gave him, uh, you know, what, what do you call it, a truckload of antibiotics, whatever uh, it is. I mean, it is. You're on big antibiotics. Big time like, antibiotics. Like vancomycin and right. cefepine and uh, sometimes even rocephin. I mean, that's one they can give IV as well, but there's others out there that we use also. Right. Um, so, and those antibiotics to be on them for a long length of time or period are hard on your your organs as well i sure. mean you have to really watch your kidneys and stuff like that so we don't want you to be on those antibiotics for a long period of time but if we have to use them we have to use them right because once you get sepsis to that point you have to use them you have to use them you know? and then after a while when he was able you know to get the hour he did come back he was able to, to make it through there but then they had to go and, and take that infection out of the knee mm -hmm. you know they can't do it while they're feeding them all the antibiotics they they have to get him get his i guess all his readings have to be good in the blood to make sure they can actually go in there and then they found out you know he was they were draining brown fluid out of his yeah. knee yeah. which just shows that's pretty nasty brown gray fluid and of course now not only is he doing that but then he has to go and have they have to do surgery on the knee to clean up whatever the problem was. Right. So he ended up being in rehab for almost five months because of that situation. So you don't want any of that to happen to anybody. That, and that's true. And I've seen things happen like with amputees, you know, where, that wear those prosthetics. You know, after wearing them for a while, uh, sometimes you get that, that callus, that blister on there. But if you're not careful, if you don't watch them really close, you get a little bit bigger blister and it gets red and if you're diabetic healing process is slow uh, and sometimes that requires going to the doctor and getting antibiotics and and the longer that goes and untreated um, the, again the risk of sepsis I've seen people come in where they they can't eat I mean they were fine just a few days ago but when they go to eat they can't hit their mouth with their spoon you know you'll see differences wow. like that you know they'll have temperatures they'll um, they'll have shivering or extreme pain uh, like i said and uh they, they can't think when they stand they're not steady um I've, I've just seen this several times and if we could have treated early uh we wouldn't get to that point but once we get to that point uh it's just downhill from there if we don't get a, get a handle on it so and how how much does age play in the, in the rapidity of sepsis or is there no real it, well, gauge it, on that. it says the the those highest at risk for sepsis are children less than one year old, elderly greater than sixty years old, those with chronic conditions or weak immune systems, and those with wounds or surgical incisions. So uh, those people we definitely doesn't mean that anybody couldn't get there, sure. uh, but those are the who are most at risk for sepsis. And if you've ever had sepsis, sepsis and been a sepsis survivor. Uh, then you're at increased risk for that happening again. It's still in your system. It's still in your system. And, yeah. And just because you had that mm -hmm. uh, cocktail of antibiotics doesn't mean it eliminated. It. It's still there. Yeah. And and sometimes you don't know where the infection's coming from. You come in and you have some of these symptoms, and your white count's really high. Um, 
then they're doing those cultures, those blood cultures and things like that to figure out where it's at and what it is that's growing and what we got to do. But, you know, we got to get those things done quickly and get those done so we can start you on those antibiotics. You know, and sometimes we're starting you on those antibiotics before we have any of those results back because we got to treat what's there, Gotta what we see. Start what we right see. now. Yeah. So some of the signs of symptoms is shivering, extreme pain, pale skin, sleepiness, or the feeling that I feel like I might die. When you get to that point, it's pretty bad. Yeah, well. it's pretty bad. And and again, sepsis shuts down your organs one by one. It just starts shutting them down. You don't, your kidneys aren't functioning just like they should be. You're not putting out the urine output that you need to be putting out. Um, so you get dehydrated. Like I said, you you don't want to eat. Um, so don't ignore those things. And I used like a surgical patient for an example because those people that go in pretty healthy, feeling pretty good, knowing they get done what they got to get done, go home and they're going to bounce back. Mm. Uh, don't get over anxious when you get home and feel like you got to do everything. Give yourself time to heal. That doing things too soon could, could trigger something, Sure. you know, uh, and, but just don't ignore the symptoms. You know, sometimes you just, I just kind of feel blah or or you you don't think it's anything it could be something sure don't wait for it to get worse before you follow up right especially if you have surgeries uh, correct you got to let the body heal and a lot of times it takes some strengthening exercises but don't overdo it because True. then you you tax the body too hard and you know a lot of times well we all know deb there's some internal stitches here or there yeah might be might be something in there if you've gone and gotten your knee scoped a lot of people say well i've got my knee scoped and scraped out Okay, let it heal. I mean, there's still yeah. there can be inflammation around there for a few days. Let it heal. Don't go outside and all of a sudden say, "Oh, I got to go cut the grass today." Yeah. Probably not a good idea. Not a good idea. Uh, you know, but well, let's just lay it on the line. You got to be aware of what your body is telling you. True. So if something isn't normal. Whether you have sepsis or maybe you've got COVID or maybe you've got another infection that's, that's affecting you or maybe you, you've gotten bit by a tick. You don't, nobody knows why you're getting that way right off the bat. True. You have got to, you know, but if you're not feeling right, if you're overheated, we talked about heat exhaustion mm -hmm. and things of that nature. If you have heat exhaustion, you've got sepsis, you probably don't have a chance because you're not going to get enough fluids in you to keep you alive. You know, that's a bad, that would be a really bad situation. A, we don't is. want that to happen to anybody. True. But you have to read your body. And if your body's telling you, I've got pain here, I should not have pain here. Or you maybe you're you're getting a whole bunch of cramps all of a sudden. Don't know why, but you are. Just And you haven't done anything different. Lose your appetite. Like you mentioned, sometimes unsteadiness is also mm -hmm. a, a, a good thing. Because if your body only functions aren't working right, you're not going to be stable. True. And it makes it hard. It makes it hard not just for you. It makes it hard on the family that's taking care of you or helping you. or, um, And maybe, I don't know, a little bit more difficult for the caregiver to figure out what's going on. True. You know, there's, I mean, lots of things are involved. Um, it, But the, the best thing is to recognize that it's a medical emergency. We need to recognize it early, and we need to treat quickly. So... So if things start getting a little out of whack this summer, it's it it really is not hard to see that something's kind of going awry. And maybe you're thinking, it's just so hot, I don't want to do anything. Well, okay, I get that. I think we've all been there before. Yeah, that's true. I really would not want to go outside 110 degree heat and work all day. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, I have in the past, but you know that's not the the probably the best solution. But use a little bit of common sense. If, if your body's telling you that there's some, I'm not re reacting the way I should, make an appointment or even just walk into the mm -hmm. clinic, get some attention. Yes. Get it now. Let them run some tests because you won't know by looking at yourself in the mirror. You're saying, well, it's the same old me. Mm -hmm. You may not see yourself being flushed. So you walk in there and somebody said, man, you look pale. You may not see it. That's true. You may not. I mean, especially if you've been outside working or whatever. And you're right. The, those tick bites that you get the tick fever with. I mean, <clears throat> you can easily think that you're just tired and exhausted from being outside working all day. And it may not be that at all. No. So, and, and of course, you're going to eventually you're going to know that because that doesn't get better. That gradually 
uh, you get to feeling worse and worse, and then you realize, oh, I really don't feel right. You know, this mm -hmm. is not right. So. And then you think you can just sleep it off, but it's not. It's not it solving the problem. That's true. You're not solving the problem, and you can easily make an appointment at the clinic seven two nine eight thousand. Get over there. A lot of good physicians. Physicians are are really they're going to be the best way. You're going to take a lot of tests, obviously, when they get there. If they don't know what it is, if it's not That's super true. obvious. That's true. Uh, they will take those tests just to find out and get it isolated down or eliminate as, I always watch CSI. We're taking your fingerprints to eliminate you from being a suspect. <laughs> well, basically, they do the same thing with a blood test. They take the test and see what to the results eliminate. are to start eliminating things. To start things eliminating things, that it, correct. It's not. It's not correct. this. It's not this. It's not this. Mm -hmm. But if they come out with a high white blood count, you just may have a problem. You know, something's going on somewhere. Yeah. yeah. You've got That's an infection true. somewhere, and they need to do it. That's true. And we have a great staff over there. Remember, the clinic is open six days a week. Obviously, Monday through Friday, they're normal times. Mm -hmm. Normal and times. at 8 to 6, right? On it's, Saturday? No, no. Mo Monday oh, through Friday. Monday through Friday. 8 to yes, 6, Yes, they're right? open from 8 to 6. Correct. And, and on Saturday, it's 9, 9 to 2? 9 to 2, yes. Okay. And that's a walk-in clinic. That's a walk-in clinic. You're more than welcome to just walk right in and say, hey, I'm just not feeling right. They can get those tests run and then come back. And, you know, if nothing else, Deb, it's peace of mind. Yes. If there is nothing wrong and you say, well, maybe it is just the heat, then they can tell you, hey, you need to drink more water. More than likely, mm -hmm. I guarantee you, they're not a doctor I know today that say, don't drink more water. Which is a good idea. Correct. And, but, there, you know, there's tests that show that uh, how hydrated you are. I mean, your kidney function test. Uh, we can look at that and, and see if it's <coughs> higher than what it should be. <coughs> and usually that's the, the reason, that, you know, is because you're not drinking enough water. And water, I know it's not the cure-all for everything, but oh. water is what makes your organs work. It's what right. makes your liver work. It's what makes your kidneys work. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's a good tool for us to use. Very important. Be aware of what your body says to you. We talk about it all the time, but it is true. It is true. It is true. It so is here true. in this summertime where we have hot conditions, you know, make sure that you understand. You know, and, and as we get older, of course, none of us get older, but as we do <laughs> age a little bit, you may not have that same propensity of being out of doors as long as you used to when you were 25 or 30 years old uh you might get tired a little quicker you, you might not be able to work as hard you know i i can i used to do outdoor maintenance mm -hmm. when i was in my late teens i used to work 10 12 hours outside yeah and yeah you're drinking water and you're going but you just keep going and going and going well i was 19 18 19 years old you can do that a little bit different huh <laughs> and you get 60 and you don't you're not as active anymore your metabolism doesn't move as fast you still need a, the amount of water you have you still got to have that water going through your system it's just when you were 18 19 maybe you perspired a little bit heavier i don't perspire like i used to i used to just sweat crazily well, i had to drink a lot of water but now i don't sweat as much but i still need the water well, that's that's true. So, and if you're somebody that does sweat a lot, you know that you're getting rid of that water. Mm -hmm. So, you know, keep drinking the water. I'm not saying you have to drink gallons and gallons a day, but you know, just constantly be you, sipping water. You don't yeah. have to take big gulps, right? You know, just constantly sip. And in and in the case, and and I've I've told this to a lot of people. And I don't know if everybody does this or not. I know when I cut grass, or mm -hmm. and I've got a lot of different grasses to cut. First thing I do is, because of all we've talked about up in the air, pollens and everything else, as you're cutting grass, and I don't like to wear a mask because it's really hard to breathe in some of the areas I'm at. If you do know wear a mask, still want to do this, take that first sip of water, slosh it in your mouth, and spit it out. Yeah. Don't want to have to swallow all those allergens if you've got a problem. That's <laughs> it true. It just puts it in your system. That's true. So slosh it around, you know, and then spit it out. Then take a nice, cool sip of water. Not ice cold, that'll burn going down, and then you won't want to drink any more water. Yeah, that's true. You know, so take a little mm -hmm. sip and let it warm up, and your body's hot. It won't take long for it to get to, to body up. temperature, yeah. and then to, and then do that a few a few times, maybe five six times. Put the water down, and go do something else, and then as you feel that need, do the same thing: slosh it, spit it out, and take yep. a few more sips. Yep. Yep, or if you get too hot, you know, try to get out of the heat for just a little bit. Give yourself a break. So, 
I always told people, if you're going to be working outside, and if you're not going to be near an area where you have shade, number one, number two, water. Because there are areas that we all know out in the middle of a farm, if you're out in the middle of a field, you don't have a spigot right there. It's got water. Uh, take a cooler with you. Mm -hmm. Have water in the cooler, but also have a couple of towels with you. Because you can get that water, pour that water on a, a towel, damp it down, and not ice, by gosh, by golly. You don't want to do that, but put that around your neck, armpits. Yep. Yep. We all know, do not put ice cold water over your chest. You don't want to shock your heart. Nope. But just do that, and it will cool you down It'll across cool you your down. forehead. True. It'll cool you down slowly. Slowly. Yeah. Don't want to yeah. do that in a big hurry. Yeah. That can that, And that can be a bad thing, too. So. It, it could be, yes. Yeah. But, and I've seen some people, they'll just take their bottle of water and just, you know, if it's not ice cold water, you can do right. that. Right, yeah. If you've got a cool water, just maybe tap water. Yeah. You can definitely do that for sure. But ice water, um, sip it. Don't don't try and guzzle it. it can, uh, have you you've guzzled ice water before? Yeah, haven't we all? <laughs> and you get that burning sensation you, you in your throat. You kind of do, yeah, yeah, because yeah, you do. Your body is hot, and all of a sudden cold, and your throat's like wow. You kind of have a little pressure there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like wow. What are you doing to me, dude? <laughs> true, anyway, true. But. Uh, I truly believe in, in in what you're telling me. Sepsis is such a scary thing, and I hope people do take heed to kind of what we talked about today. And I almost lost a brother because of it, and uh, I'm very fortunate. He's still around, but uh, it was very scary. And it you don't realize scary. it, and somebody says, oh, I got sepsis, not a big deal. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. If you've yeah. ever helped take care of someone that becomes a little confused, but just enough alert that they're they're difficult to to care for they're difficult to manage when they're in that state so i don't know how yeah. to explain that but i i just personal experience i've been there so i know <laughs> well i think all of us think we know what's best for us true and so when you get confused you're denying it's it's kind of like the denying factor i'm not i'm not sick i don't have this go away leave me alone yeah and and we all do that a little bit you know we we get a little bit of a cold or something and uh, and sometimes we're right sometimes mm -hmm. it'll just go away on its own and sometimes it doesn't and we're just a little bit hard-headed because we're always trying to um justify i guess or you know say oh this is what it's from it'll it'll be fine it's really not because of this or whatever but you know, just really pay attention to your body and, and you know what doesn't feel right what f you've experienced before and what's not right or what's new now yeah, but something you know. different. Don't play with it. Yeah. Get checked out. 7298000 is the number to the clinic at the Salem Hospital. If you have an immediate need, call 911. Don't play with things. Let them come out and get you because they're going to start doing tests right away. And they will find out if there's a problem sure. there. So especially if you've overheated, do not try and say, I want to jump in the car, turn the air on, and drive. That's not a real good idea if you've got... A heat exhaustion, you might be able to get by with that, but I still don't recommend it because you might be a little bit bleary-eyed and get a little bit confused like we talked about. Last thing you need to have is some child come in front of you. Dizzy-headed, light-headedness yeah. you might experience with heat exhaustion. Uh, yeah. Call 911 and get that get over there. If you um, become totally disoriented, you definitely call 911. You don't even want to play with that stuff. But again... Be aware of the heat, but also be aware of how your body talks to you, whether it be heat or infection or something else. If your body's talking to you, do listen to it a little bit because it's trying to tell you this isn't right. We and you know what? Sometimes I think we really do know that it's different, that we feel different, but we still want to just try to push past. We're all super people. <laughs> I know we're super. <laughs> Deb, thank you very much for coming in. Again, why don't you give your extension in case somebody has a question. 729-6626-3500. 3500. That's a pretty easy extension, it actually. Is. You got pretty fortunate. Yeah, I did. Well, very good. We always appreciate Deb coming in and spending some time with us. And our spotlight on SMH, we do appreciate everybody. And if you have any questions, uh, contact your hospital or also contact the clinic. And if you have questions about your health, get to see a doctor or a nurse practitioner, somebody who can help you and get a good idea of what is bothering you so they can treat it before it gets out of hand.
Thanks again for coming, Doug. Appreciate you. Keep it here, KSMO Radio. We'll come back with Civic Happenings in just a